Hello and welcome to another episode of Autogefühl with me, AJ. The Volvo Cross Country has been around for almost two decades and this is the latest car to wear the badge, the 2017 Volvo V90 Cross Country. It goes up against cars such as the brand new Mercedes E-Class All-Terrain and the Audi A6 All-Road Quattro. So join us as we test this car on-road and off-road to see what it's got. Are you interested? Come on, let's go. So the Volvo V90 Cross Country doesn't look too different up front than the standard V90. In fact, you can watch our review of the S90 and the V90 that we've already done earlier. But basically, this follows the new Volvo's design philosophy. It has the LED Thor's hammer headlights. And well, first of all, the inscription has concave grille with vertical slats and full length chrome strips. The R design has a convex grille with a technical structure and it's all black. But here on the cross country, you have a concave grille, really wide grille with vertical slats and each slat getting five chrome studs. So the Volvo V90 cross country has been raised by 16 millimeters over the standard V90 version. It comes with 19 inch rims with all-road uh, tires. In fact, the entire wheel size has increased by up to 42 millimeters. To accommodate this larger wheel, the wheel arch has been extended. Now you can have these wheel arch extensions in black, matte black to look like the standard uh, off-roader like the XC90, but you can also have it painted monochrome with the rest of the body, so it's a more subdued and subtle discreet look. As we continue down the side, it's very identical to the standard V90, but the window borderline is different. In the inscription and the uh, R design for the standard V90, you have high gloss um, chrome metal, whereas here you have it in black. So the V90 is 4.9 meters long, that's about 16 feet, and it's about 1.88 meters wide, that's about six feet. Up here in the back, you have the vertical rear lights, which is again, very typical of Volvo. A very sharp sloping roof line and towards the center we have the d4 badge for the engine we'll talk about that later and the all-wheel drive badging for the four-wheel drive version and then finally you have the cross-country badging on the lower bumper so let us know what you feel about this design put your comments in the section below so the v90 cross-country is based on the new volvo scalable product architecture platform and what that means is you no longer get a six cylinder or eight cylinder engine. They're all only four cylinder engines. And they all have all wheel drive. They have the generation five Borg Warner coupling, commonly known as the Haldex system. And if you wanna watch our explanation of that, you can watch the Seat Ateca video that we did last week. So basically the uh, V90 cross country comes with four engine options, the T5 and the T6 petrol, and the D4 and the D5 diesel. So they're all essentially the same four-cylinder block. For the T5, it's a single turbo petrol, which makes 250 horsepower. For the T6, it has a supercharger and a turbocharger, and it makes 320 horsepower. Now, the supercharger and the turbocharger work in unison below 3,500 RPM to make sure that there are no lags and you get quick responses. And after 3,500 RPM, only the turbo petrol, sorry, only the turbo works uh, beyond that. Now here we have the D4 in our test car. This is a two liter four cylinder turbo and the turbo is a serial sequential two stage turbo and this engine makes 190 horsepower. You also can get this uh, engine in the tune of 235 horsepower and that engine comes with something called as a power pulse which is basically a pressurized air canister which charges the turbo and spools it at low RPMs to eradicate turbo lag. So the V90 Cross Country comes in two basic trim levels. The Momentum, which starts at around 56,000 euros, and the Inscription, which starts at around 60,000 euros. But of course, you have an elaborate, extensive list of options. In fact, our test car, with all the options that it has, stands at around 75,000 euros. All prices in Germany. So here we have the key for the Volvo V90 Cross Country. Kind of reminds me of a lighter. What do you think? 
So this car has keyless entry, so the door unlocks and the mirror opens. Let's test the sound. Sounds really solid. After all, this car is so heavy, has so much of metal. So the door opens fairly wide. And since the V90 Cross Country only is offered in the momentum and inscription trim levels, you get animal skin leather uh, no matter what. We here in Autoga Fuel, we prefer animal friendly leatherette. But apart from that, I think the design is very elegant, very Scandinavian, just like the exterior. You have nice panels of wood over here, a very powerful Boren Wilkins sound system, and overall a very nice fit and finish. And you have a nice cubby hole here to put your water bottles as well. So the interior, I think, looks really nice. There isn't too many buttons. There's nothing frivolous about the whole interior at all. Again, this, the seats are also leather, but it has so many functions, including massaging. I'll show you that in a bit. But overall, I think it's one of the most relaxing places to be. In this cross-country variant, yes, it's all black, but you can obviously change the color scheme uh, to something that you, that you desire. Let's take a look at the dashboard. So the entire dashboard is completely digital. You have a speedometer on the left and a tachometer on the right, which shows you the, the position of your gear lever, the eight-speed automatic, and it also gives you the driving mode that you're in. You can only see that when you're driving. Apart from that, you have your trip, your media, and if you connect your phone, and your navigation. I think the steering wheel also looks really nice. It's very completely circular and accentuated by this stitching line in the middle. And the buttons as well are very simple. You just have two blocks instead of having individual buttons for everything. This block on the right is to navigate up and down in your menu. This is for the voice command and this is to access the menu and turn it off. And this is for your driving functions, like your pilot assist, your speed limiter, and your adaptive cruise control. So overall, I think it's a very clean and neat package. And importantly, you also have a heads-up display, which gives you your speed. If you have your uh, speed limiter or your cruise control set, it will show you a symbol for that. It will give you the next exit or turn according to your navigation system as well as show you the speed limit and other warnings and uh, uh, things like that. So I think it's a very useful system. So now let's take a look at the center armrest. Give it the shake test. Yeah, I think it passes. Pretty good build quality. You have the CD player, which honestly takes up quite a bit of space in this cubby hole. But on the bright side, you have USB ports and a auxiliary. Then further up, you have a slider which opens to reveal a couple beverage holders as well as a 12 volt power socket. Adjacent to that you have the gear console with the gear uh, lever. This is the 8 speed torque converter uh, gearbox. You have the engine on off switch. It's not really a button so flick left to turn off, flick right to turn on, the electronic parking brake and a very beautifully knurled finished uh, drive mode selector which I'll show you later. And finally back here you have another small cubby hole perhaps to put your key or some spare change. Now let's take a look at the center console. Down here you have some standard buttons but you will realize there's so few of them. In fact almost everything that you want is controlled on this touchscreen. And I think it's a really nice user interface it has a few glitches, which I will talk about later, but overall, I know a lot of people say that they don't like such big screens, they want some more buttons, but I think this is what's going to happen in the future. Everything is going to be more and more touchscreen only, so you might as well try to get used to it. Anyway, so on your homepage, you have your links to your navigation, your media, your phone, and your sound setup for the really nice Bauer and Wilkins sound system. The navigation looks really cool, it's very easy to understand, it's very modern, has really good response times, and you can scroll and zoom and pinch. Then you go back to the main menu, you swipe left, and you have a lot of your car functions. This car has so many safety features. Of course, it's a Volvo. You have lane keeping assist, which buzzes and steers the car back into lane if you're going off. 
have parking assist, you have cross traffic alert, distance alert with the, uh, the adaptive cruise control, automatic start stop, and parking in, parking out functions to help you steer the car out of parking spaces, has a rear parking camera, and you have, you can even adjust the heads up display, like I showed you earlier. You have blind spot detector, etc., etc., including you can even adjust the passenger seat if you want to move the seat back and forth for the passenger, you can do that yourself, and so many functions. In fact, the seats are also really good overall. You can adjust the under thigh support, the side bolstering, and the lumbar support, all those things, and also both the driver and the passenger seat also have my favorite option, the massage. Anyway, let's go back to the screen. Swipe right and you have your applications for your audio and you can even use Apple CarPlay and Android Auto to connect your phone. You have some apps pre-installed pre like Spotify and Yelp. And again, the sound system is really nice and it lets you individually uh, set up the sound to your taste. You can have surround sound, you can have a concert hall uh, effect. So overall, it's a very nice relaxing car to be in. And finally, in your, uh, navig sorry, your climate control is also controlled with this screen, which honestly, I think I'm not so happy with. I would like to have buttons or knobs to change the temperature, but um, I guess if you own this car, it's something that you will quickly get used to and be okay with. Okay, so let's take a look in the back seat. Getting in is okay. Well, this driving seat is set to my position. I am five foot eight or 1.7 meters. And as you can see, there is generous leg room. Headroom is also nice. There's a very expansive panoramic sunroof. I have an armrest. I have a sun visor for the side window. I have air vents on the, uh, on the, on the pillar, as well as air vents in the center. I can shut them on and off and change the fan speed. And interestingly, instead of having a USB port or a 12 volt power socket, I have a standard 230 volt plug socket right here. Apart from that, there's a mesh pouch to keep books and magazines, a center, cons sorry, center armrest, but no cup holders, but the cup holders are over here. And finally, you get isofix points as well as a incorporated booster seat with top tethers as well. Let's take a look in the trunk. So it has a power tailgate, a very big, wide, rectangular loading bay. This is 560 liters with the seats up. It grows to 1,526 liters with the seats down. That's plenty for most people, but if you want something more, you gotta look elsewhere. For example, the Mercedes E-Class is about 640 liters and grows to 1,800 liters. But overall, it's very usable. You have a flap in the middle, so if you have groceries, you can put this up so your groceries don't slide around and move around. You have hooks and elastic bands to tie your, uh, your, your groceries down. You have a gas charge strut, which opens up to show you this, uh, your emergency kit and your uh, user manual. And you can even lift this up. And down here you have a full size spare wheel and the uh, jack kit as well. Now you can, you can lower the rear seats with the buttons here. As you can see, they fold in a 60-40 fashion. And now you can pretty much sleep here if you wanted to. Apart from that, you also have a... There it is. A tow bar, which retracts and comes out electronically. So you can... You have to push it the... Uh, you have to push it back in. So when you close the power tailgate, the parcel shelf also retracts automatically. Also, you have a 12 volt power socket and more hooks on the edge here, on the sides along there, 
and just before the seats down there as well. So let's test the safety of the power tailgate. Yeah, I think it's calibrated pretty well. It's not too, it's not too soft, it's not too blunt. So overall, a very usable and large trunk. First impressions driving the Volvo V90 Cross Country. Well, I think it's a very comfortable car. Now, the V90 has a bit of a reputation of being a dad's car. And I think that's no bad thing because I can associate a lot of father-like qualities to this car. Out here on the open road, it has a lot of stability. Its entire demeanor is that of a very stable, composed, relaxed car. Although this is the cross country, which means it is jacked up by about 60 millimeters in ride height, that aids in your visibility because you're sitting a little bit higher. But on the other hand, unlike say the XC90, even though this car is very large on the outside, here on the inside, it doesn't feel as large. That big open uh, impression that it gives on the outside isn't translated to the interior space in my opinion but apart from that let's start off with the seats I really like these seats you have so many adjustments you can change the lumbar support you can change the under thigh, under thigh support the side bolstering everything you can even have different massages and again this entire system is completely digital and operated with this touchscreen there's very few buttons, so even to change the things on your seat, there's a little uh, navigation knob on the side, which will engage, as you can see, the driver's seat menu. So let's see, maybe I feel like having a massage right now. So it does get a bit uh, tricky sometimes. You have to get a bit, you have to get used to it. But if you own this car, I'm sure in a few days you'll get the hang of how everything is operated. Um, apart from that, well, the steering wheel, I really enjoy how much of feedback it gives. Now, even though this is an all-wheel drive car, essentially it's just a front-wheel drive car. In fact, at speeds above 40 kilometers per hour, it's just solely a front-wheel drive uh, car. Uh, but at the same time, it's very composed because it has the adaptive dampers. Yeah, uh, the ride height, uh, the raised ride height, doesn't play spoil sport to the handling here on the uh, city uh, outskirt roads you know there's quite a bit of bends here and there and the car stays pretty much level the steering has a lot of good feedback and um, here we're just gonna get off and get onto the highway so like I was saying the steering has good feedback at low speeds it's light so you can easily maneuver in tight city spaces. On the open road, it becomes heavier, so it gives you good stability. Okay, I think I'm gonna turn off my massage right now. It's a bit distracting. Um, but I also really like the design. I think it's very elegant. It's very simple. Like for example, just give me a minute. Yeah, for example, these buttons. You know, usually you have so many individual small buttons, but this is so clutter-free. There's nothing frivolous about this design. You just have basically two big lumps, one on the right and a small one to go up and down on the left. So it's a very clean and simple, elegant design, even for the steering wheel, and I really, I really like that. Another interesting feature that I really like about this car is the heads-up display. Now, I'm not sure you can see it on the camera, but of course you know what a heads-up display is so it gives me my speed it also gives me the traffic signs uh, the speed limit and if there's some other restrictions it displays that and it blinks you know when it changes so it gives me enough notification but it's not too intrusive and it also gives me the navigation instructions so for example if I have to take a left turn or take the next exit even that pops up 
So I really think it's a great feature. You don't have to worry about keeping your eyes off the road. You can, you can keep your eyes on the road. You don't have to take your eyes off the road. And although you do have the navigation and the speed and all of the other things down here on your dashboard, as well as over here on the right, you know, it, it is a bit of an overkill to have all these three things, but again, you can decide which ones that you want to have. You can change the settings. And I think it's a really cool feature. Apart from that, we are driving the D4 engine. So it's the two liter, four cylinder, series sequential two-stage turbo diesel engine, which makes 190 horsepower. This comes mated to the eight-speed automatic. All cross countries get the automatic. It, the eight-speed is a torque converter with uh, planetary gears, and it has two overdrive ratios. So what that means is on uh, open roads at higher speeds or on the highway, it settles in into one of the overdrive ratios and the torque converter locks up so it's a become, the engine becomes really smooth and becomes more uh, economical. But yeah, here on these winding country roads, I think the handling is, is better than I expected. Of course, it's not going to be very sporty, but again, that goes along with this father-like characteristics of this car. I mean, every car is trying to become more and more sporty with every new generation. You know, and this car isn't trying to do that. It's not trying to be what it's, what it's not. You know, it's, it's all about being comfortable, being safe, has a lot of safety features, lane departure warnings, blind spot detectors, all these kind of uh, safety features, again, which you would expect in a Volvo, especially at this price point. So overall, the entire demeanor of this car is that of a relaxed, comfortable, safe, family drive. So the cross country comes with several driving modes. So you press on this roller for the drive mode selector. So as you can see we have eco, comfort and dynamic. So let's start off with my favorite dynamic. So this stiffens up the adaptive dampers in the suspension. The steering wheel becomes a lot more heavier and the engine holds higher revs and the gearbox holds a lower gear. So it's not sporty. And again, like I mentioned, it's not trying to be sporty, but I think it's satisfactory uh, in terms of being dynamic. And if you're buying this car, uh, you should be prepared to forego some of the driving dynamics like perhaps some of its competitors would have, like the uh, Mercedes E-Class or things like that. But apart from that, we have comfort mode. So comfort makes the suspension a lot more supple. The engine holds ro lower revs and tries to uh, lock up as much as possible so that it's smoother. The gearbox holds a higher gear for as long as it can. And the steering wheel also becomes much lighter. So this is, I think this is the best setting for this car. It suits its personality. It's a lot more relaxed and a lot more stable. And finally you have eco. So, again, they've, uh, Volvo has really tried to improve the efficiency of this car by having the sequential two-stage turbo. And let's see if, how much it's working. Let me just get around this roundabout. So in eco mode, you know, the throttle response is dulled and the engine just barely takes over as much as possible. It doesn't really uh, rev out and strain itself. So now let's check the... There we go. We're doing about nine liters for 100 kilometers, which is not too bad. I think that's an acceptable number. Again, this is, if you're going to own this car and you're going to drive it on a daily basis, you can definitely expect better figures. Uh, we've been really getting the most out of the performance because we've had to make, uh, you know, the best test uh, for this car. So nine liters for 100 kilometers is, I think, acceptable for a car of this size and 190 horsepower. Yes, it's only a two liter engine, but, you know, you can expect it to be this much, so it's fine. So another thing that we noticed while we've been driving this car uh, is that 
although the system is really nice, it's really adaptive, uh, you can set a lot of personali personalizations and um, it's very intuitive and very smooth, the software is a bit glitchy. There's a few bugs that we've noticed, like for example, especially with the radio, Sometimes when we're just driving, we have the navigation on mute, we have, you know, the traffic updates on mute, everything is not, everything's on mute, but it just suddenly turns on and starts playing music on its own by itself, which is really distracting and it shouldn't be doing that. Perhaps it's, it can be fixed with a simple upgrade in the software. And another thing is uh, when you connect your phone with Bluetooth, we've noticed that when you're playing music, it doesn't really get the information from the phone into the screen properly. Like, for example, the length of the song. It will say, for example, like the song is four minutes long, even though it's longer than that. And after it hits the four minutes, you know, it's just the whole thing is a bit glitchy. But I think you can forego that. And it's not really a it's not really a deal breaker, but it's something to keep in mind. Anyway, so now let's take this car to where it's really meant to be. And that is off road. Now we're gonna take the car off-road in the snow track. So first things first, let's put the car in snow mode, rather the off-road mode. So with this, the off-road mode works at speeds up to 40 kilometers per hour, like I said earlier, after which it disengages and just becomes front-wheel drive. However, at higher speeds, it does become all-wheel drive when it detects slippage, but it's not meant to be a corner carving tool. So, and again, it's not trying to be. So with the off-road mode, it's always all-wheel drive. The steering wheel is much lighter. The start-stop function is off so that the engine is always running. Then the suspension is stiffened and the ride height is at its maximum. And you can make quick corrections really easily. The gearbox holds a lower gear for a higher time. So the turbos are spooled up and the engine is at its optimum rev range to deliver the most amount of torque. So now we're here in the mountains, in the foothills of the Alps, just across the border from Germany into Austria. And up ahead, we have our hill, hill climb track. Now the Volvo V90 Cross Country also gets hill descent control, so we can test that out as well. Keep in mind, this car weighs 2,000 kilograms, uh, just to get my facts right, not 2,400, but still not such a big difference. And quite a big heavy car and the modular two, two liter engine with the four cylinders for both the petrol and diesel I'm a bit bit skeptical about how well it's going to perform with so much weight on this big hill but let's find out so now let's go up the hill when you're going uphill oh you can't really see it on the camera but it's really steep it's important to keep the engine revved high and this turbo spooled up so that the traction control and the Borg Warner uh, Gen 5 coupling, the Haldex all-wheel drive system, has more power to distribute and play around with. And it made really light work of this entire hill. Now we're going to try to go back down. It's a very steep, narrow hill. Um, this car gets hill descent control. So I see a little symbol on my dashboard which says hill descent control is engaged. So now I let go of both the pedals, the throttle and the brake, and the car is finding traction using engine brake, using, uh, wow, this is so steep, I can't even see the bottom. Oh, there we go. It's slipping, it's slipping a little bit, but it's, it's managing it quite well. It's coming down at a steady pace. We're doing a steady six kilometers per hour. I must say, it does handle its weight pretty well. The adaptive suspension does mask the 2,000 kilograms really well, but you do feel it around mountain roads, like you saw earlier when we were driving. You can feel the weight pushing the car over and trying to understeer, but usually it has everything under control. So 
I think this was a good test and I think the car passed with flying colors. Now let's go over to the dynamic snow track and we'll see how, how fun it is to slide this car around in the snow. Okay, so now we're on the dynamic snow track. So to have fun, let's put it into dynamic mode. And we can also turn off the traction control. So let's wait. Okay, there we go. So go swipe left, ESP sports mode, ESC sport mode off. So the traction control is off. Let's wait for the thumbs up and let's see how it does. Okay, so 190 horsepower, all-wheel drive, throw it into this corner, hold the bend, hold the slide, throttle out, cross steer, oh, ah, the seatbelt is just pulling me back so tight. I mean, if you guys know your history, Volvo was the first car company to invent the steering wheel, the three-point harness that we know. And because they deemed that it was such a necessary amenity in the modern car for safety, they didn't patent or license this seatbelt, as far as I'm aware of, and they let other car manufacturers use it so that everybody could benefit from the seatbelt. And again, 2,000 kilograms, it's, it's like, it's like, driving a land yacht <laughs> and sliding around in the snow oh, and the seatbelt is choking me I don't think I'm gonna die by driving like this I think the seatbelt's gonna choke me and that'll be the end of AJ oh, it's going tighter and tighter <laughs> but yes it's really easy to hold the slide and I can do this all day if I can breathe <laughs> I'm just gonna slow down <laughs> the seatbelt release yeah but um, it's a lot of fun so you throw the car handle the weight anticipate the turns I missed the slalom over there let me try that the next lap go this let's put a little bit of distance with the car in the front I think I get a heads-up display notification that it's alerting me that there's a car right in front of me that's probably why it's going crazy with the seat belts now nah, that was just too much of understeer but it shows that if you want to have fun with this Volvo V90 cross country it is possible albeit this is not something perhaps everybody would do with their own personal car but uh, given the opportunity I think oh if the seatbelt will just let me breathe Maybe one last lap. Let's go a little bit slower this time and see. Yes, there's immediate slippage. This car does have the off-road snow winter tires. Let's try with the traction control on. Maybe that's a good test. So I'm gonna drive it briskly, but not too fast. Yes. I'm getting a lot of sliding, but it's cutting the engine power really early and it's much more controlled. Of course, it's not so slidey and slippery, but hey, on the bright side, the seatbelt isn't trying to kill me anymore. To summarize the Volvo V90 Cross Country, well, I think it's a very unique package. It offers a very elegant yet subdued, almost professorial-like design but at the same time, it has a very capable off-road chassis. I do, however, wish that the overall weight of this car was a little bit less so that it would be a much better match with the two-cylinder diesel engine. But overall, I think it's a great package. 
Please let us know if you have a cross country or a standard V90. Share your thoughts and experiences in terms of how it is to live with or how it is to service and to maintain and run. We want to hear from you and I'm sure the rest of the Autogafuel community would be interested as well. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.